Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 620. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September. What is today? <laughs> ah, this is oh, so the 22nd. Want... All right, good. It's good enough for me. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. And we're throwing the script out this week. I took no notes in our pre-show. We're just going to go and, and talk about everything from politics in the U.S., which is, ooh, tense, cre- and uh, uh, stuff going on in the church, all COVID-related because that's just what's going on in, in the, the country, in the world, in politics, and in the church. Um, we are just north of Bethany Beach here in Delaware at a state park called, I better look this up real quick, uh, Delaware Seashore State Park. We set up the camper last night and you know when you're too close to the sea it gets a little windy. This isn't the sound where we live in uh, Long Island or just north of Long Island, George. This is right on the, the windy ocean and uh, I was going to go for a bike ride last night but the temperature may have said 65 but that that wind chill is probably 35 so we're saving the bike ride for this afternoon what are you doing i am still recovering from my surgeries and oh. these people who get tattoos i don't know how they can stand it i've got four different sets of scar of uh, stitches on my body and it hurts like Ooh. it feels like i've been punched my <laughs> yeah. shoulder my stomach my uh-huh. Man, I don't know how these people can do this stuff to their body. I mean, ah, so I'm mildly in pain, which I'm sure some of our viewers are taking great. Right, very happy. Of. You know, you take your shirt off, you look like Frankenstein. It's okay. No big deal. You know, it's, you know part of being a host on Anclan Scripted is we go through lots of trials to make ourselves closer. No, we don't make ourselves. God draws us closer to himself. Um, lots of news going on. And before we... Yes? I, I just wanted to say, oh, I'm sorry, please. I, I interrupted the most important part of the show. Go sorry. ahead, Kevin. What were you going to say about? Uh, oh, uh, like. Uh, oh, yes, like the show and share the show. And please comment. You guys are the best commenters ever of any audience on YouTube. And we know that because we go and read your comments. And if you have not subscribed yet, please subscribe to the show. George, on to you. You were going to say somebody who's wished us a great deal of pain has done something really really smart oh i want to talk about gafcon uk last week we uh talked about letters sent out by gafcon uk to its supporters where they said that we're looking at the, our long-term financial viability and in response in response to that we got a number of emails from gafcon uk supporters saying what's going on here are they about to go under and we raised that issue well, Gafcon UK has since put out a new letter that has turned lemons into lemonade. I got to give them credit. These <laughs> guys <good>. are smart. <laughs> and what they did is they released a letter, uh, I believe it was yesterday, where they said Anglican Unscripted, uh, which they called a very fine show that you must watch. So, oh man, they just Thank you. flattering and buttering us up pointed out the very real need that we have to raise money to really fight the good fight and then they gave all these giving levels and everything so kudos to the sophistication and the intelligence of the leaders of GAFCON UK to take a a not so great situation where like everybody else in COVID they're hurting for money but instead of here's the kicker instead of doing the normal hit the messenger, kick back, oh, well, these people are so mean for pointing out our problems. They own their problem and then turn it around. Here's an opportunity to make GAFCON UK strong, powerful, live, dynamic, plus show those stupid Americans they don't know what they're talking about. So it, I got to uh, give credit it, to GAFCON UK. Well, in, ser- in seriousness, yeah, I, I have to agree with you there that it was a well-written letter. Uh, it was exciting to read, and I'm getting toward the bottom. I'm just waiting for them to offer war bonds or something. But, you know, it, it was a nice fundraising letter, and uh, it takes a real situation and presented it in real. And we couldn't get an honest answer from our many sources. 
and so we went with last week's program we got an answer after the program was recorded on friday was it friday i don't know what day it was and we we put it out and you know the rest is history so uh we do hope you guys give to gafcon uk and we do hope it's a um a thriving organization uh for what god intends it to be uh george there's lots of here, here, yeah. here here's something why do the english or the british shine when things are about to collapse on them their best hour was <laughs> dunkirk we just dunkirk. had the 75th anniversary of the battle That's of right Britain. sure they do great yeah. otherwise they just sort of muddle along and go from crises to crises but when it really gets bad they seem to be able to pull one out and gafcon uk did that yeah, well, I, no i absolutely agree I absolutely agree um now we're going to delve here into politics okay and george and i are not political commentators uh to the degree you're looking for we don't we would never be on fox news we would never be on msnbc or cnn uh, as commentators as yeah. people arrested for doing things that we yeah, should so, that, so, probably make that you work. know if you're looking for a great com molly hemingway a person i've had on the program before is a great commentator and and political analysis george and i are not that and in fact if you love president trump and you think he is the second coming i get it i get it i i i see um how you are seeing what's going on and you like what's happening if you hate trump and you think he is the antichrist i i get that too i see how you know you, you there's no middle ground if you kind of like trump kind of don't like trump i don't see that you, you're on one side or the other so you know when we record these types of programs when we talk about politics if you george and i'm gonna be very you know two-sided on this uh so if you hate trump you still have to watch the program if you uh love trump you still have to watch the program because we're going to not offer a middle opinion but present news on both sides of this and we have something brand new happening it's called my last wishes uh if you don't know uh supreme court justice ruth uh bader Gins ginsburg has passed on and she told her granddaughter uh, her last dying wish was not to have president trump choose her replacement oh that's sweet and i get it i if i were ruth gatorberg if i were if i were justice ruth i would not want trump to choose my replacement um so i totally get that this is the this is the the two sides we run here and uh now i don't know if i trust the granddaughter for what she's saying but it, it it is what it is and so george we are now in the point where the church and especially the episcopal church has has put out a statement about the election and about this, this season uh can you tell us a little bit about that well it's the first pro-trump statement i've ever seen the presiding <laughs> church make. <laughs> it is and it's pro-trump in that he is accounted as a human being <laughs> usually the episcopal church refused to him as he who should not be named or uh, that vile man in washington or that political huckster or whatnot well presiding bishop michael curry did the right thing great job michael curry he put out an e michael curry is a good old-fashioned Lim limousine liberal he is what he is yeah. the man of his time and his generation and so on and he does not care for donald trump he doesn't like trump's policies all this and that but he put out for him a very balanced there are two sides you know evaluate them carefully ask yourself what jesus what how would christ view these situations and he didn't then do the what i would call the catherine jefford shorey bit which is have the cat walk in front of the uh, screen at this time. <laughs> That's uh, cute. We got to keep that. Scoot, scoot. <laughs> oh, with the claws in my chest. The uh, which which is and Jesus would do what the Democratic Party would do. He didn't do that. No, he didn't. So he offered a, and then he went on to say that Episcopal bishops and the Episcopal Church never, ever, ever endorse candidates. Now, the only, Gene Robinson was famous, uh, infamous for many things, 
including breaking that rule. He endorsed Barack Obama, actively campaigned for him. Mm -hmm. And this was considered something, well, you just don't do that, Gene. Well, Gene had been doing so many things that you just don't do. <laughs> I don't think they, he cared anymore. No, it was, yeah. But we're sort of getting back into that uh, sense that the church must be a church for people of both liberal and a conservative political views not theological views it must only be liberals well but. no but you could presiding bishop michael curry could put that type of letter out because the entirety of the leadership in the episcopal church is liberal or uber liberal and they want to think of themselves as being bipartisan you know and so you know if you're bipartisan name for me by 10 bishops currently serving in the Episcopal Church who are pro-life who would show up at a pro-life rally no and two name for things. me two yeah. different things no hold name I'm for me I'm sure there are more than 10 who are pro-life but how many will show up at a rally that's the key that's the key how, how many of them voted for President Trump again uh, we probably have many many more than you would think but, but never the it. culture is yeah. not to uh, not to uh, well. If well, you are going to break that rule, you break it in one direction on the mm -hmm. liberal side. You do. Uh, because, well, the well, you said the culture. The Episcopal Church is the original cancel culture. If you stood up and you were on the conservative side in the eighties and and early nineties, you slowly got yourself canceled. Uh, you were no longer invited to the meetings that you needed to be. You were slowly put out of leadership. The same has happened in the Church of England. And so the cancel culture has existed in the church long before national politics. Yes and no. Um, because remember that, uh, how come no one's ever canceled me? And I'm as obnoxious and opinionated <laughs> as they come. Uh, well, yes and no. We have to remember that there are a good number of Episcopal clergy who had martyr complexes, who were looking to die in a ditch, mm -hmm. or were looking for trouble. I remember you and I were at the, uh, what was it, uh, not Cincinnati, what's that other town in Ohio where the convention was? Oh, Columbus. Columbus. We were at the yeah. Columbus Convention mm -hmm. that elected Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. And after the vote, I talked to John David Schofield, Bishop of San Joaquin, and asked him how he voted. And he said he voted for. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, as did John David I uh, J Jack Iker did, but John David Schofield and another number of conservative bishops, active and retired, voted for Catherine Jeffrey Shorey over Henry Lee Parsley, a moderate from from Alabama, so that the whole House of Cards would come down. They wanted to force things and bring it to an issue. So. To then then complain about Catherine Jeffrey Shorey being mean and unfair when you when she only won by one vote, she only beat Henry Parsley by one vote. Be careful what you wish for. I mean, if you try to fiddle the system, eventually you may have a short-term win of the most obnoxious, atrocious person as presiding bishop, but then it's going to turn around and bite you. Uh, and this is what happened with these guys. I wonder if this is mimicking the the political situation we're in now with Trump, but we'll see. Um, yeah, it's... I mean, uh, uh, Frank Griswold was famous for protecting Keith Ackerman, mm -hmm. putting him on the committee. Keith Ackerman was on the standing committee of the Episcopal Church at one time under Frank Griswold. Griswold, who is a limousine liberal like no other, still had that sense of fair play and we need to at least make a token nod to diversity real diversity not uh not the current fashions of diversity so I, i'm not saying it's universal far from it and most of the guys second three level tears down who got hammered were hammered had nothing to do with them personally but their leaders did not do as good a job if, if the desire was to uh reform the church from within they decided they were going out and they're going to go out in a bang yeah well they did and uh we've seen lots of little things and big things occur after that 
Um, in the news, we saw some Methodist news, and they're kind of mini Anglicans in my mind. Uh, so we may as well talk that the Episcopal Church and the liberal Methodist are going to have a unity thing, but maybe not. What's what's the latest one? that? For years, the Episcopal Church and the United Methodist Church is about talking about moving towards full communion, such as the Episcopal Church has with the uh, ELCA, mm -hmm. which means that at the end of the day, it only means that Methodist clergy can get jobs in Episcopal churches and ch Episcopal clergy can get jobs in Methodist churches because we already have full communion because no Episcopal church that I know of will stop a Methodist from coming up to the altar to receive Holy Communion. And no Methodist church will refuse an Episcopalian. So we have de facto communion. We're not just talking about jobs for the boys. That's what I thought, yeah. Well, this was put on hold because the Methodists are in the middle of unwinding the United Methodist Church into a liberal and conservative branch. And the Episcopal Church's committee met with the Methodists committee working on this, and they said, well, let's wait till you're unwound. And what they didn't say, which was probably the reason, is we don't want these conservative Methodists uh, part of our new show. We want to wait till you get rid of all your bad eggs. Then we'll, then we'll have a... Uh, full intercommunion it's once you get rid of all your ACNA types well now isn't this an opportunity for the ACNA types to uh, have full communion with the conservative Methodist then certainly is as yeah. I mean ju just uh, I don't know the full state of the North American Lutheran Church's ties I don't know if they're in full communion or I don't uh, yeah <laughs> you'll have to talk to Ray Sutton about that yeah and I'm sure Ray Sutton I don't know this because I don't talk to Ray Sutton like you do, so I can therefore speak with I can speak and Kevin has to be quiet. I'm sure Ray Sutton is looking very hard and long at these Methodists who are withdrawing mm -hmm. and seeing what uh, the Anglican Church in North America can uh, do for them mm -hmm. as fellow brothers in Christ who have similar ethical and uh, doctrinal uh, similarities. And a good history together. All right. Uh, trying to think of any like we threw this script out with this one remember that so we're, we're going off the top of our head any other news you can think of george yes the uh church of the government in england has uh, forbid irish catholic families from gathering for dinner yes yeah, right <laughs> well, it's nobody no over more than six, six right? people can be gathered in a private home so if you've got six kids you gotta have two upstairs mm -hmm. until the first shift is done eating uh, dinner downstairs yeah uh the, the, the from my outsider's perspective and full of an absence of knowledge um i read the i read yesterday more people died in traffic accidents than died of covid in covid infection in britain mm -hmm. yet britain is poised to go back under a new round of heavy-handed restrictions on gatherings and things of that nature one of these restrictions are no more than six people in a social setting and so i i've well, you say restrictions. Observing. Isn't this just advice? Well, it's guidance. Guidance. But see, the problem is the British character is they don't know the difference. But see, here's an American speaking. If the government gives me guidance, <laughs> if I want to do it, I'll do it. That's right. Guidance only in an American context reinforces what you're already going to do or you ignore it. In mm -hmm. Britain, that's why Britain always had such a rough time from the EU. E would put out these directives and guidance. The Italians would say, "Yeah, we're not going to do that." The British would follow it to the letter. That's right. Well, mm -hmm. they have this guidance, and so the Church of England interprets guidance as, as being law. holy writ set down from God. <laughs> they don't actually view the Bible as holy writ set down by God. Yeah. But something put out by the uh, health by department, the, uh, National Health uh, Service, yeah. that is from God. So they, they're, well, this is not a time to talk about the reality of COVID or this or that, because I'm no expert, but I do think that we've reached a point where there's such an exhaustion with the overreach of experts, of people who have been, you know, in the United States, the CDC is now looking at me like a clown college, not the Center for Disease Control. Mm -hmm. First, masks were bad. In fact, they made it worse. Now they're required. 
it's spread by airborne contact. It's not spread by airborne contact. It's spread by toilet seats. It's not spread by toilet seats. Now I it's mean, eyes. Now you now your eyes are your leading uh, cause of infection with COVID. Yeah, no, I, I we. That's why that's why climate change is dead because you know all the science says. Well, the science has been wrong continuously, and it changes uh, week by week. In fact, it, it, we have, if there, if COVID was not going on and the, the press were not so focused on Trump, you would have read uh, three weeks ago this amazing climate scientist uh, step back. They put out this major paper and said, yes, all our forecasts were overreaching and using assumption data. And this is from one of those big German places where, you know, it, real scientists work <laughs> and you know one of these places is always you know always looking at the negative uh news and climate science has finally came back and said well our models were over assumptious and clearly if you look outside it's not as hot as we said the glaciers are still there and the sun still rises and sets we're sorry about all that we will redo our models for our next set when we're fundraising next year it's like wait a minute <laughs> That would be, well, I'd probably never, never make headline news because the news is all in for climate change. But if it weren't for the single focus on Trump and the single focus on COVID and the single focus on everything bad, there was actually good news about climate change and it never made it never made it the papers. It was so sad. So, Because the, the rule of experts, mm -hmm. uh, the rule of science is, is gone. Yeah. Because science has become as politicized as any other endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have um, you have uh, scientists withdrawing papers uh, or downplaying their results if they're politically incorrect. Um, it's not just the social sciences, which have always been a bit squishy, but the hard sciences of uh, just pandering to the latest knowledge and this and that. Now, I'm not a virologist. I have no knowledge whether hydro hydroxychlorine uh, is good, bad, indifferent. I know we both took it when we were in Africa for mm -hmm. malaria. Uh, didn't do me any harm. Uh, I, was, and there I, was, are I was constipated, but whatever. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, that you, you should get on MSNBC and That's share right. that. And that'll be another reason. <laughs> but the, 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 the point being that, you know, the, the scientific experts are seeking to scare uh, the opposite side, not to say, well, there's a 30% chance or 40% chance it'll be effective. It's either completely effective or it's completely poison. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, who have taken this in the past, sort of look at both sides saying, no, after I took this medicine, I didn't just jump up and r run a marathon, nor did I drop dead. Uh, well, you came back from one Africa trip pretty sick, but that had nothing to do with the medicine. Uh, that, that, that was dysentery. <laughs> that was, that was really bad. But that's it. We've lost. We've lost the middle, George. You, we are so polarized. Cholera. Trump, cholera. I had cholera. That's cholera. Right. That's right. We we but love. That's why this lovely complexion of mine tinges yellow. It does a little. Yeah. See, mine's done with light. <gasps> White. Yellow. Mine um, is blood pressure and cholera. <laughs> So, we, we are so polarized right now. You love or hate Trump. There's nobody says, yeah, he's okay. There's nobody says, he's okay. It's the same with COVID. You know, you love or hate the treatment. Um, it'll kill you or it'll cure you. Kill or cure. And there's just no middle ground anymore, George. We've lost that. No, well, no, news, journal, no news journalist puts out a two-sided story. Because every story has two sides. At least, yeah. Part part of this, I've never had much patience with the evangelical wing who have said that Trump is a bad, as does bad things. Therefore, you cannot support him politically. Um, I've never had much patience with that, and it's not just political. I mean, whether uh, what, whatever Trump's politics are, um, if you're the, there's a strain of American thought that needs to deify uh, their their leaders or their workers. Uh, so we have this new thing with the replacement of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a judge. 
uh, okay, in 2016, the Republicans played hardball and didn't let Merrick Garland have a vote. And now they're pushing uh, a vote for whomever President Trump will choose. And people are shouting, hypocrisy, hypocrisy, and the Republicans are coming back, well, we had this rule and it still applies, this and that. And I have no problem whatsoever of the Democrats or the Republicans taking opposite viewpoints because I view this as a political act. It is political. Yeah. It's a political act. Mm -hmm. Yet these people get so worked up about politicians being political. And it's uh, because they invest or, in them some virtue. Yeah. All politicians that, lie. They're, they're all Scott. I mean, all of a sudden. <sighs> I mean, there's such a naivete uh, among some some people who insist that, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter was a very honorable, decent man who never put a foot wrong morally in his life. Yeah, he Horrible was a, president. Yeah. the first time I got to vote, I voted against him because he was a rotten president. Yeah, doesn't make you a Jimmy policy. Carter has been married to, uh, what's her name, Rosalind, what, hmm? 60, 70 years now? Ronald Reagan had been an actor and been married and divorced and, you know, hmm? so on and so on and so on. Hmm. You know, if you want to talk, but at the end of the day, what did America need? It needed a man of Ronald Reagan's character, personality, gifts. It didn't need Jimmy, man of Jimmy Carter's gifts. It's, and maybe after going through the morass of of having had Lyndon Johnson and uh, Richard Nixon, you needed somebody squeaky clean like Carter to sort of cleanse the palate before you got back to work again. It's no secret that I did not vote for President Trump. And I'm extremely pro-life. And if after four to eight years of pro-Trump, uh, of the Trump presidency, we no longer have uh, a million babies aborted a year. I may have been not on board when I should have been. You know, if you want to look at the ends justify the means, wow. Well, okay, this is a great example um, for for abortion. So I don't know, George. I don't know. It, once again, we're not the best political analysis. If you want church and Anglican and Episcopal analysis, this is where you go. It, we, there's a letter out there this week that it's says this. the secularization this. of yeah. modern life. Yeah. Of where when you believe in nothing, you'll start believing in anything. I, see. I, I think that was uh, Chesterton who said that. Yeah. I may be wrong. No, no, no. Probably am wrong. But if you keep your eyes focused on Christ, if you keep your eyes focused on the gospel message, if you keep your whole spirit and self focused what is important, eternal, unchanging, the crap of life, Republicans versus Democrats, this, that, and the other, is of such little consequence to the eternal ver verities of the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's, well, I just... From a historical perspective, let's. I want to step back with the, the judicial nominee thing. So far, whenever a president has nominated the ultimate conservative, this is the guy who or the lady who's going to once again overturn something we don't like, and we're going to go back to legislative law and not uh, judicial law. This this is the person when a conservative president nominates a conservative justice they usually are moderate at best which we just recently found out with the last two uh supreme court justices coming from trump if i were the democrats i would not make a big deal of this because you're more likely than not not going to have the ultimate conservative judge come from trump or any other um uh, conservative president, Republican president. In fact, if I remember, the most conservative judges came from some uh, liberal or Democratic presidents. Uh, and actually, the, the most conservative judges on the bench right now, Clarence yeah. Thomas, came from George H. W. Bush, yeah. who so. was the mo a moderate. He was not yeah. a conservative. That's right. So. <sighs> You never know, George. George, this show is going to be eternal. We're almost up to 30 minutes. We need to cut this out. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've just wasted another half hour of your whole life. 
but with it. You'll never get it back. Call it Anglican's Unscripted Exit, episode 620.